Right, uh, welcome everyone uh, to our latest Alta Insights webinar. I'm Jeremy Yoey, Alta's Vice President of Communications, and uh, we've got a double feature of webinars this week. On Monday, we heard from Stuart Econ Economist uh, Ted Jones, who provided a forecast for the next year. Um, what was his overall theme? Well, <laughs> I think as we all know, it's going to be a little bit of a of a tighter market. Um, at the end, we always have a little Q&A and, and one person submitted a question asking, well, anything positive you can share? <laughs> and uh, yeah, both myself and, and, and Ted you know, said, yeah, the, while the market's gonna be down, um, this is a kind of a perfect time to analyze your operation, your staff, and, and make any uh, necessary or needed changes so when the market does pick back up, you'll be poised to, uh, to capitalize. And, and that's really why today's discussion is important as it's essential to, to build a culture of ownership with your employees and, uh, and, and understand how this can drive results even as the market contracts and becomes more competitive uh, for purchase orders. Uh, before starting and introducing today's speakers, I always gotta go through some of the um, normal housekeeping items. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, you'll get an email with a link to the, to the recording tomorrow, and you can always access all of our webinar recordings at alta.org forward slash webinars. That's alta.org forward slash webinars. In the meantime, you can also download a copy of today's presentation from the handout section in the GoToWebinar window pane. A, uh, anytime you have a question, uh, submit them in the questions box. We'll hold a little bit of time uh, for Q&A at the end. And with that, let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, joining us today, uh, we have Steve Rudolph. Uh, Steve is founder of Steve Rudolph Coaching, where he helps companies uh, become better at managing people, coaching and developing others, handling difficult conversations, building and leading teams, servant leadership, and change leadership. Uh, some of his clients include Fidelity National Title Group, Novo Nordisk, Amway, Kaplan CFO Solutions, and Asheville Independent Restaurants. And a quick interesting tidbit from his bio, uh, Steve was a guide for the US Paralympic team, guiding two visually impaired Nordic, ski Nordic skiers into Olympics. So Steve, I'm sure if you can help uh, visually impaired skiers make it to the finish line, you can help people attending today's webinar improve their company culture. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jeremy, for the warm introduction. I, I don't know about that last comment. I'm gonna do my best. Uh, the relationship between visually impaired skiers and title agency owners and managers. We'll see if there's a connection here today. Hey, welcome everybody to our webinar, how to build a positive ownership culture to weather market headwinds. I'll say a little bit more about myself in just a moment, but let's, I wanna get your head in the conversation right away and have you answer this question here in just a second. But here's really our big theme and um, that culture is a lead indicator of profitability. If you get culture right, results will follow. And that's really our business monitor today and trusting in this process uh, to build the type of culture that builds you a sustainable competitive marketplace advantage out there in the competitive title world. Um, but here's a chat question for you. Uh, what what is the meaning of this value represent to you? Drop it in the chat. Twelve thousand dollars. What value or meaning does that have for you? What does that represent? It may seem like a trick question, but um, it's not. Well, it kind of is. Pop those uh, answers into the chat box, and we can uh, share them with Steve. I know your brain probably aren't ready to like you're going, what? Twelve thousand dollars. Let's see what we get. No one's submitting any any uh, chats. I know. Well I thought so. <laughs> they someone put it in the questions. Oh here we go. They're going into the questions box for some reason. All right. Uh -oh. uh, the cost to hire a new person, the amount uh -huh. to train a new employee. Here we go. Oh, they're coming in here. <laughs> Stipend for attending today's webinar. <laughs> hey. down, down payment, the cost to onboard a new employee, a week of groceries. 
1984 Ford 150 pickup truck. Great. Are they all in? Anything else coming in, Jeremy? No, I think that, that that's about it. Yeah, well, we've got a couple winners. Absolutely. This is a this is the average cost for an employee turnover. Um, and this number, it's it's really this is based on kind of industry averages. If you take someone's salary and take about 33% of that, so if you have someone making what 18, 19 bucks an hour, that's about 36 grand a year, I think. So there's that third, that $12,000. So if you wanna if you wanna do some painful math. Um, how much turnover do you have annually at your title agency? Um, how many folks do you turn over annually or monthly and multiply it by $12,000? And you can do some painful math if you want to get the computer out. But I think this is an important number to keep in mind as you go forward because the, it's so costly to have employee turnover, and you all know that. But to put a dollar sign to it, I think that reality um, really helps to motivate us to create the best workplace culture to attract and retain great people. And that's really what we're up to we're up to today. In the restaurant industry where I'm from, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, the average annual turnover cost is around $150,000. And my turnover cost at the restaurant I had was about 180, a little higher than that. But I know restaurants that are, I talked to a restaurant owner yesterday, that's $220,000 a year of annual turnover costs. So you know this is a costly expense and it's really imperative for us to get the, the culture piece, get the culture piece right. So thanks for jumping on board this morning and doing a little, uh, getting your brains engaged. So here's our learning goals. Uh, we're gonna look at that linkage between culture, uh, resiliency and ownership and profitability. Um, we're gonna look a little bit of a toxic workplace, the cost of that, a toxic employee. And really what are the elements we talk about? We, you know, we all want an empowered ownership uh, culture, how do you build that? I'm gonna give you some tips and tools for that. And we're gonna have a conversation on what um, workplace elements are best for attracting and retaining great people. You know, what are the trends in 2023 and moving forward? And then we'll close up with just a little bit of reflection on your uh, your go-to management or leadership style and what, where with your management and leadership might you flex a little bit to uh, make you even a more effective leader and create the workplace that um, is gonna attract and retain great people. So this is me. Well, not really, this is Gordon Ramsay from Hell's Kitchen. But this was me. I grew up in the restaurant business and owned a semi-fine dining steakhouse in Northern Michigan. Um, I sold that about 10 years ago. But this was me. I, I, I turned into a raving lunatic chef owner and uh, not completely proud of that. I'll share a little more. But you know, here's the best thing about buying your own business, any business I think, is you never have to work for another jerk again. The bad news is you become the jerk that nobody wants to work for. <laughs> and so I started I started losing good people. I'm like, you know, why am I losing good people? And I figured out, you know, I found the enemy and it was me. And so my emotional, my communications was all over the place. I had a good mentor at the time. I kind of hit bottom. I was a workaholic of sorts. And I had, I just had to bring in more of structure, meetings, one-on-ones, um, and controlled my communication, how I'm communicating to people, the message in I'm communicating, where am I under communicating, where am I over communicating? So I made a lot of failures, you know, a lot of mistakes as leading and managing people. And I had it wrong, I had the business formula wrong. I focused on results and I really drove results in the business. Um, you know, labor costs, revenue, profitability, customer satisfaction, but I had it backwards. And, like I said, I had a good mentor who turned it around. And so then what I started focusing on was focusing on my people first. Grow and develop people and engage them in the work. Build your team and culture and then trust that results will follow. Again, culture is a lead indicator of profit. And I had to kind of come to it the hard, painful way. Um, but when you buy a business, it's, you, it's, it's the worst job you can have because you know it makes the worst job you can ever have. A job you can't quit and nobody will fire you that's a bad job so that's a little bit of my story i sold the business 10 years ago and then i uh went on my own leadership management consulting coaching and training business where i am today and um basically i just became a student of leading and managing people because i made so many mistakes and hopefully i can help other people avoid some of those and i've been working in the title agency for about 10 years now working with title agency owners managers and their teams on helping them grow, develop, and build the business and uh, create positive workplace culture. So I'm excited to be here 
today working with Alta membership. Here's another chat question for you. Improvement starts with what? Drop it in the, if you can drop it in the chat box or questions, that either one's fine. Jeremy will find them, but if you can put them in the chat box, it'd be great. Improvement starts with what? Hopefully we're all on the phone today, conversation, because we want improvement. We may have a good culture. We want a great culture. We have a good business. We want to be in greater business. But it's all beginning with improvement and change. Well, Steve, uh, most people are saying improvement starts with myself. Um, some uh, other words starts with willingness, awareness, starts with leadership, starts with communication. Great. So mindset. Mm -hmm. identify, yep. Identifying the problem. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Empowering your, empowering your people. Mm -hmm. Yep. No wrong answers. Yep. Sharp. A sharp crew today. Yeah, it starts with I. And uh, a lot of folks got that one right away. But we, we say in management, we get what we model and get what we tolerate. But all change, we have to start at home. You know, there, there's a disease that can take place in organizations that says, if only somebody else would change, if only those people would change or they would change, things would get better on here. And when you ask the person, well, are you doing that? And they often say, well, no. <laughs> so um, leadership can begin anywhere. It's not a title, it's a behavior, it's an action, but it does begin with I. And if you're a leader manager on the call today, owner, you know, it, it asks the questions, am I a leader worth following? Am I someone that, you know, why should people follow me? And we need to model the way for our people. So great answers, you're on it. I wanna make a, a comment about change and initiating change. If you're motivated today by the way, or hopefully you leave with one or two nuggets today of an area of your operation that you really wanna bring some attention and resources to, to strengthen or develop the culture, I just want to make a couple comments about change management, change leadership, and just some of the things that I've experienced. First of all, we need to model the change we want to see in others. <clears throat> but this idea of pull versus push, um, there are times when you push down change from the top, and this is just you know a new policy and it's non-negotiable. But generally, culture change, you want it to be a pull. And what I mean by that is a is a conversation where you involve people in the dialogue around the change, what's needed to change, what should change, and, and what commitments we can make together. But to get full buy-in from people and commitment, um, I think pull, pulling people in, uh, engaging them in an ongoing dialogue and conversation is the most trusted, trusted pathway for sustained change. Um, you can push people, but it rarely works. And the reason being is because, because if you push people, if you tell them, they'll may do it, but that's compliance. They're gonna do it because you're the boss and because you said so. But we don't want compliance as leaders. We want commitment, you know, intrinsic motivation. So if we want true commitment for the long term, then I think pull and not push is the best healthy process for that conversation. And here's a, a really simple three-step change process. So. Uh, Leaving here today, if there's a culture change that you want to make place, I want to give you a framework for initiating culture change and keep it pretty simple. And then and this is really effective and it's it's three steps. First step is getting really clear. How do you want your people to act? What are those behaviors that you're not seeing that you want to be seen? And two, how do you want your people to interact? Because of course, an ownership, resilient, positive culture means uh, implies high levels of collaboration and solution oriented. So how do you want people to interact? And three, this is the real critical leverage piece. What's the mechanism for change? What's going to cause the change and help sustain the change? I'll give you two examples of what I'm talking about. Um, first one, how do you want people to act? Well, I want my more tenured staff to be respectful of our newer, younger team members. So maybe you have some generational conflict at the workplace, for example. Um, how do you want people to interact? I want tribal knowledge, institutional knowledge to be shared across functions and departments. And three, mechanism. Our onboarding program will include a mentoring component. We're going to pair our more tenured staff with newer team members. So there's an example of a mechanism to achieve the outcomes you want in terms of these more desirable behaviors. Here's another example for you just to get the wheels turning. Um, I want people to start identifying and solving problems, right? I want to see more initiative, bringing solutions forward, not just problems for my people from team. 
and I want to increase teamwork and collaboration. The mechanism for that is every Monday we're going to huddle around a continuous improvement whiteboard and identify together top issues, solutions, and who's responsible for what by when. So there's an example of a mechanism to achieve those behavior outcomes. But this three-step process is to help frame up in your mind to get clarity on what outcomes you're trying to achieve so you can communicate that with clarity to your people. And then also there has to be some mechanism, structure, or process that's going to uh, facilitate that change and build that change into the culture. The other way to think about mechanisms are rituals. Culture is built around rituals. If, if you celebrate every employee's birthday and everybody signs a fun birthday card and you celebrate, that's a ritual that's intentional building a culture of positivity and recognition at your workplace. So rituals, think about that. What sort of rituals can you put in play to um, 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 build out the culture that you're looking for? So there's a couple of examples. For you. Hopefully that's useful, that three-step process change to frame that up. Um, because the skills of an organization are no greater than the skills of its people. So your title agency capacity for growth, increased market share, competition, staying lean and mean is only going to be possible as your people grow, as I shared with my opening learnings as a restaurant owner operator. So it's really about building up people individually. And again, that formula for me, which I think is a trusted formula for any business, is coach and develop people first, build your culture, and focus on results, and results will come in that, in that order. And um, that's from Ken Blanchard. So I love this quote, right? Are you hiring dead people or are you killing them on the job? And let's, let's just pause for a moment and assume that your operation, you do a good job of um, selecting and hiring great people. So we'll make that assumption up. But then what happens after six or nine months and someone starts to disengage? I mean, outside of things going on in their personal lives, because life happens to people, but they, they just start to become demotivated or disengaged on the job. So we're going to look at the, these the elements in the workplace of cultures that retain people or, or tend to disengage people and have them call, leave and cause you turnover. But here's a couple sobering, statistic, sobering statistics. 52% of voluntarily exiting employees saying their manager or organization could have done something to prevent them from leaving their job. And about the same amount say they're three months before they left, neither their manager nor other leaders spoke with them about their job satisfaction or future with the organization. Think about that. That's, that's pretty sobering, right? Like three months before someone was going to leave, you know, no one even talked to them about their job satisfaction. And so um, obviously the message in here is, is having a highly engaged management and leadership team that's having me ongoing, meaningful, purposeful conversations with your people, keeping your finger on that pulse. In HR, we call those stay interviews. How likelihood is the person going to stay with us or are they at risk for leaving? And um, so I think there's a, probably a rich opportunity for everyone on the webinar today to making sure we're having those regular one-on-one -on -one conversations with your people and making sure those are meaningful and substantive to the team member. And so you can maybe make a, uh, a change in how that's affecting their engagement. Maybe, maybe they need more work-life balance or more work flexibility. And these are rather simple things you might be able to do to keep somebody keeping that $12,000 at the top of our, top of our mind. Uh, but here's the not so hidden cost of turnover. We know it's not just that $12,000, the cost of hiring and loss of productivity and onboarding and training and so forth that we know associated with that 12 grand. But of course, damage to a company's reputation. And once the word gets out on the street that you turn over employees, it makes it even harder to attract new employees because uh, your reputation is being tainted. Uh, lowered customer satisfaction and loss of customers. You know, you know, what do you think when you go into a, a business that you frequent on a regular basis, whether it's a restaurant or the bank or the grocery store, and you constantly see a new face, right? What do you, what's our natural thought? Like, wow, man, they, this, this place must not be a great place to work um, because they really go through employees. Something must be toxic around here. So as we say, perception is reality. You lose that tribal knowledge, which is very expensive, of course, and it's a big asset. Deferred or lost revenue, overburdened employees left behind, which leads to burnout, high cause of uh, turnover. 
and degree, decrease cultural morale, and this feeds into a cycle of ever increasing rates of turnover. When you have people leaving, it causes other people like, oh, you're leaving, and they, you know, everybody talks like, oh, you're going over there, oh, you're going to make a buck more an hour, you know. So everybody talks, and that gets other people thinking, well, well, maybe I should be looking around for a job, maybe I should be looking for a better position. So it really creates a, a negative cycle of um, um, negativity, as you, as you well know. So these are those hidden costs. Um, so here's a chat question for you, another one to pop your brain. What's one that you can immediately do to improve business performance? What's one thing you can immediately do to improve business performance that really doesn't cost much money, although it does cost your attention? Hey, Jeremy, while they're dropping those in the chat box, is my audio, uh, video, everything okay? Yeah, it's uh, it's looking and sounding good to me. Hopefully, uh, everyone out there is it's working well for that everyone as well. So, uh, getting getting some comments populating in. Uh, what's the one thing you can do to immediately improve business performance? Counsel that toxic employee to change or get rid of them. Meet one on one with employees. Listen, ask questions, check in more often start having conversations with employees, more staff meetings, mm -hmm. address the issues timely. Good stuff. Recognize a job when a job's done well. Great. Absolutely. Recognition. We're going to talk about that. There, that's rec recognition. That was another one that just came in. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no wrong answers. Well, the um, the image should give it away when you look at rotten apples on the ground. And uh, there's a couple folks there that, that got it. But toxic and getting rid of toxic employees, you know, uh, you're only as strong as your weakest employee in an organization, as we say. And and there's no better way, right, to disengage a top performer than tolerate a poor performer. So the tolerance, tolerating toxic employees is very costly for the business. And there's some numbers out there. I saw a bunch of big numbers. Um, you could probably do your own math, but firing a toxic employee is definitely a way to in immediately improve business performance and grow your profitability. And what happens when we get rid of that toxic employee? There's two things that always happen, right? is your employees say thank you very much and then they say what took you so long to do that right and we tend to we tend to make a lot of reasons and excuses for keeping toxic employees one of them is a lot of time with toxic employees they do one or two things better than anybody else right like oh who's going to do that job you know because they they have a lot of tribal knowledge and and a lot of times they're really skilled in an area or two so we have to be honest about that but i think we have to be really clear as managers and leaders is somebody better than nobody is somebody better than nobody uh jeremy was making it aware of me that there's been a downsize in in the title industry because the the depression of the real estate market and so forth and increased mortgage rates and so um you may not be feeling the pinch of the tight labor market that maybe you were 12 months ago. Um, but nonetheless, even if you're a lean and mean machine right now, um, boy, rooting out that toxic employee would be a, a, a strong move for you um, business-wise. I really encourage it, which leads me to um, think that I think it's important as managers and leaders, we need to be able to identify toxic employees. So here's a few red flags. Steve, yeah. quick, quick question. What if the toxic employee is your top producing employee? What do you do then? Yeah, great question, Jeremy. Um, we could go back to that slide that says the non-financial cost of the toxic employee. Mm -hmm. That person, they may be making the cash register ring, right? So they're bringing in dollars at the front end but what are the dollars going out the back end because of all those um, negative consequences and implications in the workplace mm -hmm. odds are they're they're treating a lot of customers poorly 
odds are they are um, work, creating a headwind for your efforts at creating a, a strong customer loyalty base. My guess would be that they are tough to work with, that they have, they can be transactional. Um, they, can, they can just not be a good team player. And so I, my, my personal experience is that the cost will always exceed the benefits of a toxic employee, even if they're a top performer and they're making the cash register ring. That's just my experience is you are going to pay for that person over and above the revenue they bring in. And we could argue about that all day, but I'm pretty clear on that. Um, Jeremy, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I think you, you, you got to definitely look, you know, more long term than how it will impact your gotcha. your company tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly right. Here's um here's just a few things to uh, look out for. Um, people that crush other team members' self esteem and confidence. You know, they can kind of be bullies in the workplace. Uh, they undermine your team success. Um, I had a mentor that told me there's only two types of employees, fountains or drains, and you want to hire fountains because they shower the workplace with positivity and collaboration and cooperation, and, you know, they're very customer service forward and engaging, and your drains are just, you know, they're always sucking the life and energy out of your workplace, right? They're like always circling the toilet bowl, so your, your saboteurs, your toxic saboteurs will always try to undermine your cultural improvement efforts. Um, making others, they're, they're questioning people's move and decision, they create a, an atmosphere of criticism and cynicism and um, kind of intimidation. They block teamwork and collaboration, demoralizing the staff, um, makes people run out the door, and they corrupt the work culture so it's not a psychologically safe environment, which in turn stifles innovation, creativity, productivity, and collaboration. And that's probably one of the top, if you look at leadership and management trends for 2023 and pandemic, post-pandemic, one of the top leadership um, capabilities, believe it or not, is empathy. It constantly pops up empathy. Um, and tied to that is a leader's ability to create a safe workplace environment. Because think about it, if it's not a safe workplace environment, Problems aren't getting resolved. Problems aren't getting surfaced. There's a lot of politicking going on. There's a lot of underground, you know, networking of gossipy, you know, kind of negative behavior. So, you know, ask yourself, how safe is our environment? Can people speak up without fear of retribution? Um, and also, if people don't feel safe speaking up, how do you innovate? How do you stay competitive? How do you adapt and pivot? Um, because that can only happen if the environment's safe for people constantly pouring their ideas and solutions forward to improve the business and the operations. So a psychologically safe work environment is one of those just top leadership imperatives um, moving forward and certainly around for diversity and inclusion as well, your efforts in that area. And so I've come to learn the hard way over the years, and this is my mantra is hire slow, fire fast. Again, you gotta be really clear, is somebody better than nobody? And uh, it took me a while because I brought in a lot of warm, warm bodies just because I felt so stressed and under pressure, as, as you all do probably a lot. But again, you pay for these employees that, you know, the team just looks at you and says, who hired this bozo? And of course, you know, it was me hiring the bozo. Um, and so I just uh, hopefully this will encourage you to get really more disciplined possibly in your in your hiring process. So here's another chat question for you. Uh, what does your organization do very well to retain people? What does your title organization do every day that makes it a great place to work? Drop it in the chat and see what we got. See if willing, people are willing to share their secret sauce publicly. That's right. It's always risky. Someone, someone could take your idea. I had a, I had somebody say, well, I'm not going to share. I'm like, well, come on, share what it is. I, I encouraged her to share. And she said, well, we have a, we have a high five program. We have little sheets of paper that has a high five on it. And we encourage each to get employees to give each other a high five, put their name in there, why you're giving them the high five. 
for you know their teamwork or customer service and they put it into a box and every friday at their team meeting they draw it they draw a couple few i forget how the box and the people and the winners get a reward or a prize and it, it just creates an uplift in the whole organization you know just so simple a high five program um that yeah, recognizes yeah, some of the things coming in, Steve, a free day off for their birthday. Mm. Empowering their employees, flexible with hours, making family and their kids' activities top priority. Uh, someone has a what's called a, a U Rock program. Yes. I love that. Sound of that. Connection to company's values. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yes. Making sure they know management supports them. Yes. Acknowledge, acknowledge success stories to the team. Mm. So simple to do, so inexpensive. Uh, profit sharing, uh, another birthday, paid birthday off, and a I'm not sure. Uh, get out of jail free card that is drawn at each quarterly staff meeting. So I'm not sure what you got to use the get out of free jail I like card. For. <laughs> yeah, I like that. that's got my piques my interest. Yeah, me too. How do you get in? Huh. Kimberly, we well, have to follow up with that one. <laughs> those are all great great organizational operational cultural elements right there. Yes, that that makes the top ten of zoom a lot and, lot of a lot of them flowing in so people are doing a lot of things out there uh, kimberly followed up jail quote marks being work so maybe they get a free a free day uh, yeah that makes sense okay that makes sense uh, competitive salary reviews and incentive compensation based on volume excellent yes good stuff out there yeah, if you're not paying attention to paying compensation right now, you're not in the game. Of course, COVID is, uh, I, as Jeremy said, I have a lot of hospitality clients just because that's part of my background, but um, I have several clients that uh, pay dishwashers 20 bucks an hour starting wage, 20 bucks an hour. And pre-COVID, it was around 14. So yeah, if you're not, if you're not paying attention to paying compensation, you're just not in the competitive game because the world has changed, right? For better or worse. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions. Those uh, those are all super strong. Um, I've got ten here, and I think you got several of them in your list. Uh, we always start with hiring the right people. Um, you know, hire slow, fire fast. And so, might be an opportunity for 2023 for you to look at um, your your selection and interview process. Is it coherent? Is it method? Is it methodical? Is it structured? Is it consistent? Or do people just rush into the interviews and with no clear questions they're going to ask? And um, but the hiring process should be at the top of your list. Um, and right along with that is a great onboarding training experience. Um, I think a lot of organizations have an opportunity here to really um, strengthen this and appreciate the power. Of a strong onboarding program. I'll give you just a, a simple example. If your onboarding pro process is something like this, where the new employee comes into your operation and the first thing they really do is kind of the technical aspects of the jobs. You know, here's the employee manual, here's where you park, here's where you punch in, here's where, you know, those technical logistical parts of the job. Um, you should reverse that. You're the first part of your onboarding program should be all around PEC, developing personal emotional connection to your culture. So it should be introducing people to people and their teams, having them shadow people, hang out with people, get to know people. Because what's everybody's number one question that they have when they get a new job, right? What's, what's everybody feeling? will i fit in here do i belong will i be successful that's all basic human psychological needs our onboarding program needs to reflect basic human psycho and social emotional needs of of a of belonging and contribution and involvement so that's just a just a quick tip for you 
Um, if you don't do exit, exit interviews, I really encourage you. They're always, sometimes they can be hard to get good quality exit interviews. I know that. But when they're done well in a space, in a psychological space of safety and trust, man, you can get some really rich information, really why people are leaving and the things that they liked and the things that um, caused them to disengage. So um, exit interviews should be part of your HR process. Uh, analyzing management, we, we know by now people don't quit companies, they quit managers, they quit us. That research is out, it's sobering. Um, we're, as managers, we're not the only reason people quit, but we have a 73% variance on employee engagement. 73% variance on employee engagement. So managers matter a lot. And that's one of the number one impacts why people are leaving. And so when I say analyze management, what do I mean by that? Well, do you have a consistent performance management system in terms of um, the frequency and quality of feedback people are getting, recognition, goal setting, standard setting, um, expectation setting? Is there a consistency across your operation, big or small? Um, and should your people be managing people? Do they like people? Are they are they servant first leaders? So um, that's worth really analyzing. Being recognition program, folks have already brought that up today. This is um, one thing in 2023 for managers out there and leaders: make recognition your superpower. Um, it is one of the most simplest things we can do with consistency that makes a big impact on employee retention. We talked about paying fairly and competitively and compensation. Um, you know, everyone got traumatized by COVID. We're, most of us are still traumatized in some way and still going through post-COVID. But we know across the country, the mental health has, has really been a big concern for people, anxiety, depression, isolation, loneliness. So do you have mental health support at your operation? Like an employee assistant network program, for example, you might consider um, building a safe positive inclusive culture which is why we're here today work job flexibility this is a top one and offer growth training and development opportunities that's a big reason why people stay or leave is this a place that i can grow learn develop and are there maybe some career um, steps so those are the 10 that i kind of came up with um, i would encourage you to just pause right now and reflect on your leadership and management what might be an area, just maybe take one or two area, no more than that, that moving forward, it'd be worthwhile putting some attention, resources, and getting everyone focused on at your operation moving forward to attract and retain great people. So maybe just pick one or two and select them and say, yeah, let's let's build this out and make this, you know, the next six months, get this piece really right. And uh, I guarantee you, you will experience some positive results. Let's make a shift here. Uh, we talked about the title of the program, building ownership cultures, resilient cultures. Here's, here's a definition when we talk about this. The ability of an organization to anticipate, prepare for, respond, and adapt to continuous change and sudden disruptions in order to survive and prosper. Obviously, we've all just went through a pandemic um, that caused all of us to, man, be way more resourceful than we thought maybe we were capable of. You know, and some of the innovation and title that's come along that we probably would have thought we'd never see in our lifetime um, in the in the title industry, but we've really had to pivot and adapt. So this is really the mantra of the future: is building a culture that is resilient and capable of adapting, innovating, and pivoting on the fly, and a culture of people that really embrace change. And we hear this a lot, right? People don't like change. My people don't like change. And that's, I, I don't really buy that on the face value. And here's why is because humans have shown to be incredibly resilient to change. Again, just look at the pandemic. Look what the change we had to make in our personal and professional lives to be adaptive. So humans are really quite capable of change all the time. But here's, here's what I find with organizational change and culture change. People don't like change that's too big, too fast, or poorly understood. Too big, too fast, or poorly understood. In, in other words, if it's just pushed down from the top and not pull, there's that pit pull versus push, and you don't communicate the why to the change, make the business case for the change, connect it to people's livelihoods and security, and engage them in a conversation on the change. Yes, they do resist change, they absolutely do, um, because it's being under communicated to them why this is being done. So a lot of times we have to really pause, we forget to answer that why question and um, enter people into a conversation around that. 
Um, so here's, I think everyone is here on the call today because we want to strengthen our culture, build an ownership, resilient culture. And so here's five leadership capabilities for empowerment that I think are critical for to be successful. One of, before I even pop out the first one is we have to have a long view of culture change. Um, culture change does take time. It takes incredible, clear, compelling leadership and leadership that perseveres, that's not gonna quit just because the things get rough. Um, so here's number one, managers, we gotta let go of command and control leadership. Um, the two, empowerment and command and control just don't go together. And if you're one of those managers out there that likes to keep a tight fist on the operation and people, um, you're gonna have to learn to let go. And I know this is risky business and you have to tolerate, be able to tolerate uh, risk and uh, mistakes and failure. And it's a two-way partnership. I talk about partnering for performance conversations. Employees must let go of this waiting to be told and take the initiative to lead themselves, take ownership of problems and be solution oriented. And um, it, it's really agitation to management, right? When you have employees that come to you and they just wanna be told or they're always coming with complaints and they don't come with solutions. And this is a way to begin to shift that conversation and that expectation again. Think about the three steps for change implementation um, here. Um, but, em but employees need to be trained. They actually, this is trainable. Initiative is trainable. Um, you know, some people just have more initiative than others to work with, but I, I find this is trainable, but it does take some clear leadership to get them aboard. So you must develop partnering for performance relationships, which I call these are. These are proactive, ongoing, one-on-one -on -one and with your team's conversations about the, your vision, the direction we're heading, the culture change, making the case for why, and enrolling people and getting them on board. Now we know with change, you can divide your group up into three reactions. One, your early adopters, right? Those are your early enthusiasts, and they'll say, gosh, boss, we should have made this change five years ago. The people in the middle, they're kind of the wait and see folks about this change, maybe a little skeptical, but they're gonna wait and see how their peers embrace it. And then you got the people at the back end, the cabooses on the train. Then those folks are slower to come along. You still try to pull them, but at some point, if they're not joining, then you have to have a different conversation because culture change requires 100% participation. Culture change requires 100% participation. Nobody gets a buy. Everyone has to buy in eventually, and it doesn't last forever. They got to get on board. Um, and this is that point I was making about team members. They must be trained in self-leadership, taking ownership, showing initiative, solving problems. That requires leading themselves. I would call it self-leadership, but that's trainable and coachable. It, it's, absolutely. And managers, tied to number one, you must learn to delegate. And employees must be proactive, taking this should be solution oriented. So this partnering for performance conversation, management employees have to come together with a new charter, a new covenant, a new uh, way of working together in agreement about the kind of, kind of culture we want to work at. So those are just a few leadership capabilities to think and keep in mind. Um, and good, we've got a lot of time. This is our last slide of the day. I want you to just pause at this point in the webinar and to reflect on your go-to leadership style. This is not um, your style under stress or when you're at your best, but just kind of your go-to day in and day out. And if we put it on a continuum from left to right, really hands-on to the right to really hands-off or micromanager to the left. Um, your hands, your micromanagers, these people are you know autocratic, they're very controlling, they have a telling style, fairly low, they, they can be aloof in the distance, but not always. And th this is not always bad to be over here, by the way. I don't want to get into bad or good here because there are situations and individuals where it's important to be a little micromanaging, a little more direct with people for it to be successful. Uh, a lot of managers who fall over here are pretty good, can be really good at driving results. They have high expectations. They're very bottom line driven. Um, so there can be you know advantages to that leadership style. But as a whole, Having that kind of autocratic micromanager direct as a whole is not very effective for attracting and retaining employees. If that's your go-to style, 
which was mine when I owned the restaurant for a while when I was going crazy. I was an autocratic leader. I started losing good people. So I think that style has a place, but not for um, for duration. Your hands-off managers, these are, we call these managers laissez-faire managers. We call it fake empowerment. They say, oh, just do what you think. And it's like, it's like your employees are living on an island. They get no guidance, no support, no direction. Um, and they feel very disconnected, distant and absent from you. And there's, it's a low feedback environment by the managers, not very wrong. That middle kind of sweet spot between the two that flexes, we call it a democratic or a participative leadership style. This is where you have true high participation involvement, true trusted partnerships, true empowerment. There's a lot of two-way feedback. That's that partnering for performance um, relationship that um, I was, I've been um, talking about today. And so just reflect for a moment. Um, I won't have you put it in the chat box, but what's your go-to style? Just think about that for a moment. Where are you on the continuum? Day in and day out, not your best day, not your worst day. And by the way, if you're not sure, you can text one of your, a couple of your employees and ask them, they will tell you your style. <laughs> um, and the, the, big, the big theme here is, you know, the question, what's the most effective leadership style? Well, of course the answer is it depends. Well, it depends on what? It depends on the individual in front of you, and it depends on the business context situation. What is required, what leadership style is required for you to be most effective? And can you flex your leadership style into a zone of discomfort for you that you're not comfortable? For example, let's say you are more of a hands-off, laissez-faire uh, manager, and um, your people need more direction, clarity, and you're not getting performance out of people. They don't, they lack standards, they lack expectations, there's no accountability. Well, you have to be more hands-on. You have to swing over to that micromanaging side of side of things and be more direct with perhaps with people um, and provide more clarity with people and tell people. And that might not be comfortable for you. But as we say in manager management lingo, um, most good management, you have to learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable, right? You have to learn to have these conversations, these tough, difficult conversations that you might not be comfortable having, but that's what the situation requires. If you're a real micromanager, you got to learn to let go. You can't have innovation growth and be competitive in this marketplace if you're not adapting and growing as, a, you know, building an ownership resilient culture. So if you're kind of on that autocratic side of things and more handling, you're going to have to learn to flex and let go of control and have more participation from your employees, more input and ideas, and learn not to have to be the smartest person in the room, um, and embrace the idea, which I had to, that the team is actually smarter than you are. Um, um, as we say in true collaboration, none of us is as smart as all of us. So thinking about your style, where's your go-to, and then think about moving forward, leaving the webinar today, what individual or situations would might cause you to flex your leadership style to be more effective to get that culture and the outcomes that you want um, and uh, because it's the um, platinum rule of leadership the golden rule of leadership says treat others the way you want to be treated the platinum rule of leadership says treat other people the way they need to be treated not the way you're comfortable around them but the, what, what do they need in flexing your style well, that's the end of my content for the webinar. I've left some good time for Q&A. Hopefully we'll have some folks stay around for some participation. I've got um, a final slide here. Uh, leaders' number one priority ought to be, in my opinion, drive fear out of your organization. Why do I say this? Well, as I mentioned, creating a psychologically safe environment, I think is the number one culture building priority that leaders and managers should have. So people feel safe speaking up feel safe you know because that's only where good ideas are going to come from that's only where how you're going to be innovative and can continue to serve your customers in in faster better quality ways and so innovation ideas solutions opinions uh, a more an inclusive work environment can only come in an environment of safety and so we ought to be driving fear out of our organization so people can feel safe speaking up and speaking out thank you everybody for your participation today 
um, Q&A time. If there's any questions, Jeremy, I'll let you kind of facilitate if we've got anything going on. Yeah, thank you. We do have about 10 minutes. So if you have any questions, pop them in the questions box. Uh, Steve and I are going to be hanging out for a bit. Uh, again, th thanks uh, for all the insights, Steve, on, on ownership, right. culture, and, and empowerment. I, I've definitely embraced uh, not being the smartest person in the room. So <laughs> I think I've got that one down in spades. <laughs> we do have, have a few questions that have come in. Um, one from Melissa on um, toxic and employees and her question is you know what what do you do if upper management refuses to address the toxic employee yeah if you if this toxic employee is well known and upper management is well known of the impacts and the cost of that employee and they choose to do nothing Alyssa there's not much you can do there's not much you can do um, I have found in my experience um, the best you can do is bring it to people's attention um, if they're not aware of it. But once they become aware of it and they're choosing not to move on that, uh, I've found that there's there's not much you can do. I wish I had a more sophisticated response for you, but um, you either have to live with it or leave or leave. Um, because if they know about it and they're not going to do anything to do about it, your efforts at influencing their decision, I find, is just a real minimal success rate. I've just found less than 10% success rate. Sorry to not be so hopeful about that. All right, we're getting a bunch popping in here. Um, a question from Janine on uh, remote workers. There have been a lot, you know, from, from COVID, you know, a lot of companies are bringing people back into the office, but there are a percent that are still working remote. Um, any suggestions on motivating and retaining remote employees? Great question. I didn't have that up on my top 10 for retaining employees, but that's definitely should be up there. My fail for not putting that up there today, but the work from home is an ongoing conversation and source of tension in many organizations trying to figure out that sweet spot there. Um, and, then, and that ties into that work life, work flexibility as a prime attractor for people, for um, employers of choice. Is this a place that I can offer some hybrid or work from home options? I know that's a big driving criteria of talent out there. Was the question um, how to maintain connectivity, connection with a work environment? What was the question, Jeremy? Sorry. Yeah, I, I I've moved it to the archive. Yes. Yeah. How do you how do you keep them engaged and how do you retain them? You know, I, for a little yeah. commentary, I've worked at ALTA for 14 years, almost 14 years. During that whole time period, I've worked remotely. So I think it's part you've got to have the right Great question. Here's um here's what I discovered in the pandemic. I'm gonna I'm gonna take my video up. Yeah, Steve, I think we lost you. Can you hear me now, Jeremy? Yeah. Huh, I got kicked off? I don't know, can can you hear me? I can hear you. All um, right, you're back. Oh, great, apologies. Um, what I found out, what I noticed during the pandemic was that Manage, the good managers during the pandemic were revealed. And what I mean by that is that there are really great managers out there who were um, focused on building people, maintaining connection, a psychologically safe work environment, uh, paying attention to team and culture and creating um, avenues for connectivity. Um, those managers continue to do well with the pandemic. Your average mediocre managers, the pandemic just exposed them for their weaknesses. And so I find some things to be true, even with the hybrid work, you have to be very deliberate and intentional about building connection, building that psychological safe environment, making people feel connected, involved, in the know. And it does require much harder work than most managers are used to having to do to maintain that human connection with people. But being clear on your regular team meetings, opportunities to socialize, um, and being much more 
you know, having more regular one-on-ones, for example, in connection. So um, I think the great managers who are doing it all along are much better than the mediocre managers doing COVID, but the hybrid work environment, I know I work with companies that are 100% virtual, 100% virtual, and they have fantastic cultures. But leadership and management is very intentional about the cadence of communication and the things that I mentioned. Hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Steve. Um, we've got a few more questions. Um, Christopher was curious to get your thoughts on um, how do you handle an employee who calls in sick a lot? They, they want to be respectful of their health issues, but at the end of the day, they need them to do work so others aren't carrying on that extra workload. You know, maybe any tips or thoughts on, on how to handle that situation? You broke up a little bit, Jeremy. Did I hear how do you handle an employee situation? The person is, is sick a lot? Yeah, that's yeah. the crux of it. That's a, that's a tough one because we want to be a caring um, leader. We want to create a caring, supportive atmosphere, and we have business to do. We're always balanced. There's a natural balance between there. There's a tension there that exists. When you have an employee that's going through some medical issues, for example, which is very challenging, or any sort of personal issues, um, I find this pathway to be the most sustainable, and that is um, you make accommodations where and when you can without undermining your culture. Um, if you allow too much leniency in terms of days off, um, the culture is going to suffer because people have to pick up that slack and you know that's going to cause people to burn out and demoralize you and you can't risk that you just you can't risk it you've got too much invested in your business so providing clarity with the person i might say something like this gosh jeremy um i i i, I certainly understand the health situation you're going through and uh i have very much concern for you and and i love the word and versus but by the way and is a nice bridge word and it's really impacting the business, Jeremy. And I'll go through the impacts with Jeremy. And so, Jeremy, um, here is here is the the bottom line or the non-negotiable um, situation we're in right now. And I'd be very clear with that person the amount of days they can miss without consequences of possibly being their um, hours being reduced to part time. But looking at some of the options you have um, versus um, having to release the person. So it's a tough situation. You have to balance between the compassion and the business, but at some point you have to know what the threshold is and making sure you're not undermining your culture and creating a double standard that's going to come back to bite you. Yeah, yeah, you definitely got to find that right balance. Uh, we'll, we'll try and get through a couple more questions. I know we're close to the top of the hour. Um, question from, from Brian. He says he's a newer manager. He's been with his organization for 20 years. And now he's managing people that have been there longer than he has. You know, how do you pull those employees out of some of their bad habits or ways? Any any suggestions or tips there? In under a minute? <laughs> 30 seconds. Brian, right at the end, drops the big one on us. I love it. Tough situation, Brian. Really tough situation. You know, it's it's right up there the new manager who was part of their peer friend group and now is managing their friends. It's one of those tough dynamics and you've got another one on your hands there. Um, we start all our working relationships with setting expectations, Brian. That's where that's where our partnering for performance, that's where trust is built and start with expectations. You have, have an expectation conversation. What are your standards for behavior in the workplace? And if their habits and behavior are falling below there, you have to let them know that this is the way you're expecting things to be. And your job is to have to hold them gently accountable, but you're going to hold them accountable. And it's part of change management too, Brian, thinking about getting this person to change, make a business case for, you know, why should they change? Um, what's in it for them? What's in it for the business? Um, but it's a, that's a tough situation, but um, you have to take it head on. You have to be direct. You have to be proactive. You have to be clear and you have to know going into those conversations, again, what's non-negotiable, what's the line in the sand for this person, because that's how the performance of your organization is going to run by making sure everyone is, you know, a, a, a lined up with your standards. 
So these are tough conversations, but you got to be direct. We call these tough conversations, but I would start with standards and expectations, your core values, for example, and um, see if they'd be willing to partner with you and come along. Mm -hmm. Great advice. Yeah, tough one. Uh, great advice. Uh, we have a few other questions. Uh, Steve's contact, his email is in the slide deck. So if we don't get to yours, get to yours, please feel free to to reach out to him. Um, yeah. If if you missed parts of today's webinar, or if you think others in your office would benefit from listening, uh, a recording of the presentation will be available at alca.org forward slash webinars. And again, tomorrow you, you'll get a link to the recording and a copy of the presentation. You'll, you'll get that email tomorrow. Um, and just before we part, maybe, maybe uh, Steve, one more. If you could share any examples of coaching techniques for employees uh, to help develop self-leadership. Mm. Coaching techniques for developing self-leadership. Yes, great question. Um, well, Great coaching to make a distinction between managing and coaching, manager hat, coaching hat, coaching, man, great coaches ask great questions for starters. So that's a skill set you want to bring into this conversation. And it's a combination of a push and a pull as well, though, um, is, is letting the person know your vision, mission, and expectation moving forward, the culture thing. And if it's around um, self leadership, you can ask the person when I when I say I say Jeremy when I say self leadership what do you think I mean by that? So I would engage Jeremy in a series of conversations and open question about him to get him in the conversation with me, um, and, and clarify together what you mean by self leadership and say well Jeremy, what's what would be the benefit of you elevating your self leadership capability here with the organization? What, what would it be in it for you? How would you benefit? And then share with them how the company would benefit and, and invite them say, is, is this an area that is this a development area for you that would be mutually beneficial for us to engage in a coaching conversation on in helping you elevate and grow these skill sets. And I would even make it about the person's long term career aspirations beyond your own organization. How would it benefit you, your longer term career goals to be really effective at self leadership. So through a dialogue of, of questioning and active listening in some telling to getting them to have their own insights about the value of this and once they saw the value of this on their professional development their career development oftentimes you'll spark a motivation in them for um, engaging with you in terms of a development pathway or action plan for developing self-leadership it is trainable um, but approach it from a real coaching kind of a question dialogue uh, again this idea that management is something we do to people Coaching is something we do with people. So we'd want to have a with we conversation. Yeah, thanks, Steve. You know, asking questions is always a great place to start. Uh, Joni popped in, uh, in in the questions box, uh, another tip. Give permission to the team member to use their initiative. So, you know, just mm -hmm. empowering them to to become the, that leader that you hope they can become. Um, if Love you're it. looking for, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, Steve. Any more thoughts on that? No, I just said good, good, good response, Joni. Awesome. All right. If you're looking for uh, more insight on uh, how to enhance your career, uh, supporting your team during times of change, or for marketing strategies in a down market, I encourage you to uh, register for the upcoming Office Springboard, which will be held March 20th through 22nd in St. Louis. Uh, you can find more information on that event at alta.org forward slash springboard and with that that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation uh steve uh, thank you again for joining us today you're welcome jeremy thank you alta members thank you everybody all right and with that take care everyone bye